welcome to Build Your Own Birds, uh, Bird Sanctuary. Um, our present uh, presenter tonight is Mitch Leachman, who is a coordinator, uh, or he's a director of programs for the St. Louis Audubon Society and coordinator of its Spring Conservation Home Program. Uh, Mitch has been active with the Audubon Network for more than 25 years and is on the, has been on the staff with the Audubon Society since 2008. So welcome, Mitch. He's, he's a wealth of information. So let's hear it. Thank you for being here. Well, th thank you. Thank you, Matt. And so I'll do uh, a little sound check with you, but also uh, if uh, or more of the participants uh, could, could chime in and confirm that I'm being heard, that my volume. Sounds good. OK. All right. Very good. Um, well, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Madeline. Uh, thanks to the Missouri River Regional Library for the invitation uh, to speak with you all tonight. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, there, there's not a whole lot that one could say good about and, and yet one of the things that is a seriously positive thing uh, that I've had the chance to experience, and this is another example, being and sharing with folks uh, that I wouldn't necessarily have, uh, otherwise, because we're, you know, historically all about person presentation, person program, um, and I'm I'm hopeful, uh, and I imagine this to be true, uh, that that organizations like mine, uh, the the library, um, Lewis County Library, which is where Matt, uh, me and this this uh, presentation, uh, that. Even after vaccine, even after things return to normal, uh, that we continue this sort of stuff. That uh, you know, collaborations and using the web, using Zoom, technology, uh, and you know, it certainly minimizes expenses. It minimizes travel, uh, time, and all that sort of stuff. And and so so that's that's a positive. Happy uh, to see it. again groups take advantage of. Um, let me let me do one other little check here before I get too far in. Um, I, I've got um, a couple things on my window, and I'm screen sharing, but I just want to make sure uh, that um, uh, these these two Zoom things are not being seen by you all because that would be annoying. Uh, is anybody seeing anything other than my presentation slides? Not here. Okay. Okay, so you just seen a nice, good PowerPoint slide. Awesome. I was I was hopeful that I'm looking at Zoom controls that only I can see. Just wanted to double check. All right, so um, we've got uh, the the schedule tonight uh, says an hour and a half. Uh, I do not plan uh, to be talking for ninety minutes. I fully expect to. Uh, 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 spend uh, roughly 60 minutes, possibly a little bit less uh, on my slides, but sharing the message and the information with you all. Um, and, and then of course, time for questions and, and I don't have any place to go, uh, nothing virtually calling my attention. So I'd certainly be happy to stick around, uh, you know, all the way up to hour and a half or what have you, if there are questions. Uh, and speaking of which, uh, um, hopefully you all are comfortable enough with Zoom. Uh, find your way to the uh, chat function. Uh, should you have questions, uh, uh, things that uh, you want to ask about, just use that chat function. And Madeline, we will look at that um, at the end of the talk, and we'll try to make sure that we get to questions. Um, but it's just, I found it easier with online presence when I'm in, uh, very interactive uh, and prefer to take the questions as they come along. Um, but uh, just the nature of the technology and me being here and you all being at your own places, it's a lot easier to use the chat and then take the questions at the end. So, so slide, I not say a whole lot about, but in case, uh, and the reason that I'm here with you all, uh, uh, I will take a minute. Uh, you don't often see such a busy title slide. Um, in this case, three logos. Uh, you know from the intro and from the description of the program that I work for the St. Louis Office. Their logo 
Uh, there's a reference to the Brain Conservation Home, which I coordinate, which is a program of St. Louis Audubon, uh, which is quite frankly, uh, so much time talking about uh, teaching, inspiring, and sharing information about native plants, about gardening. It's um, it is a regional, an on-the-ground program. We actually work directly with landowners, but it's this area here in St. Louis. Um, so, so I won't talk a whole lot more about the Brain Conservation Home Program. All like excited about it, but um, uh, we we can't really service you uh, out in mid Missouri. But but I will come back to it. The there is a program uh, that is uh, essentially identical to Bring Conservation Home uh, uh, that provides the same level of support through through Columbia, Missouri. Should you happen to live in that area, and then the Missouri Department of Conservation, you see their triangle logo, uh, our amazing agency. Um, and we have their logo on here for two reasons. Uh, one, because they are a tremendous resource uh, for anybody that wants to talk about um, sharing resources, a dive, men's surface cover a lot of different ideas excited about this thought process and then again share some resources uh, for you to pursue further uh, investigation and further uh, further knowledge so the conservation department has a lot of resources also we, we post their logo very prominent because uh, they are a very generous uh, supporter of our brain conservation home program we have a cooperative agreement we're one of dozens of nonprofits across Missouri uh, that have a cooperative agreement with the, the state uh, uh, agency, the Missouri Department of Conservation. And they provide a significant, uh, all, although um, somewhat small, uh, level of financial support for us. Uh, it's a very important level of funding, although it certainly doesn't cover all of our expenses for the program. Um, all right, very good. Let's get into things here. Um, uh, make sure, hopefully. Slides move forward. Do, do, do. Make sure slides move forward. Here we go. All right, slides move forward. Awesome. So, uh, bird sanctuary. Um, you know, uh, say those words, and uh, you know, you you may rightfully uh, be thinking about bird feeders. Um, you may be thinking about suet feeders. Uh, that's what this is, right? This is an upside down suet feeder for this amazing red bellied woodpecker. A uh, very photogenic woodpecker that it is, um, and I'll just let that play for a sec because who doesn't like to watch woodpeckers? Even bird song. Um, most of my videos are taken from behind glass. This was apparently a, a warm enough day that the screen door, uh, the patio door, was open, so I actually got bird song there. Um, so, oops, didn't want to do that. Um, so uh, you may think of seed feeders, right? Uh, tube feeders, uh, you may think of uh, thistle feeders, right? The Niger seed that get the finches in, uh, platform feeders, right? Um, uh, you know, let's not of course forget about our uh, beautiful and amazing hummingbirds, the ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, and, and that's great, that's great. There's, there's nothing wrong with bird feeding. There's nothing wrong with supplemental bird feeders like that. Um, and uh, I, I've been doing uh, gardening for birds. I've built my own bird sanctuary for you know 15 years now, uh, here at our, our little small uh, home in St. Louis County. Um, and yet I still have bird feeders. I still put them out um, uh, less than I used to. Um, uh, but uh, but if that's what you're doing, um, you're you're going to get some pretty interesting birds. Um, but it'll be limited. Um, you know, you get your cardinals, you know, uh, you get your morning doves uh, feeding on the ground, especially, you know, you get your finches, uh, some of the birds that we saw on the other slides. Um, uh, but you're limited. Um, there's only, you know, two to three dozen different bird species uh, on average in, in your typical backyard 
uh, here in the Midwest, a uh, few dozen bird species, they're going to come to feeders that are going to take advantage of and are able to utilize the supplemental feed through bird feeders. Um, what's an important uh, point because the potential, right? So, so if you pursue this thought process that we're talking about tonight, if you think about gardening for birds, if you think about how you could make some adjustments and improvements to your landscape for birds and other wildlife, um, you, you could, uh, you know, very realistically, uh, you could attract 100, 110, 120, 130 different species, different varieties, different types of birds to an average landscape, to an average residential landscape. Um, if you've got a larger landscape, uh, if you've got uh, more uh, diversity within your space, maybe multiple acres, you know, maybe you get more than that. Um, uh, you know, if, if you're more restricted, depending upon, again, where you live, you know, the size, other things around you, you know, maybe 100 is, is too much to, to, to ask for. But the point is that uh, simply using bird feeders is limiting. There's only so many bird species that are going to take advantage of those foods and, and, and yet going down this other path, gardening and, and such uh, for wildlife and birds has a much, much greater potential for additional diversity, additional variety of birds. So I'd be remiss uh, without um, uh, pointing and saying, you know, if we were in person, right? If this was a, a little bit more suitable for, for dramatic interaction, um, I'd, I'd be asking for people to shout out names of birds. So instead, I'll just tell you, we've got here in the, in the lower center uh, we've got the American Red Star. This is a really cool warbler uh, that passes through Missouri uh, in the spring and the fall. Um, here on the upper right is one of our smallest flycatchers. It's called a blue-gray gnatcatcher. Um, and then many of you uh, may recognize uh, the cedar waxwing here on the left, which we'll actually see uh, a couple more times um, uh, during the talk. Um, uh, so... Um, we are talking about, again, improving the landscape, right? Landscape scale, working gardening, working plants, doing things in the landscape beyond just those bird feeders to draw in the birds, to draw in the wildlife, to provide them what they need. This is a functional landscape. This is a bird sanctuary. This is a residential landscape in St. Louis County that has been managed for some 20 years uh, by uh, the, the, the custodians, uh, by Margie and Dan, um, specifically for wildlife and especially for birds because that's their passion. Um, and uh, when we talk about uh, um, uh, what we're doing today, when we talk about this overall construct, this overall concept, uh, we use the word habitat. So, so I'm going to dive into what habitat means in a minute. But, but again, this is habitat. And the other thing I want to... Um, uh, I, I want to emphasize, uh, as you can read the description here, the definition. So what is habitat? You know, so this is a dictionary definition of habitat. So we're going to be going through, again, top level examples of how one can create these conditions. What can one do and what do you need to do in order to provide the conditions, the physical things that the wildlife and the birds need? But look at this, just while this photo is up, it's a great photo. Um, I like it um, for, for a number of reasons. One, because it, it is clearly a landscape. It is a lived-in landscape. It's a people landscape. There's people using that landscape. There's very familiar aspects to the landscape, like the grass, like the hardscape, the borders, um, uh, you know, and yet there's lots of stuff. There's lots of plant material. There's lots of things in there, which in, again, the case of the definition here, there's habitat stuff. Uh, in the photo as well. So, so uh, the point there, and you'll see several other examples, I'll, I'll really drive this home, is this isn't about giving over your landscape, giving it up to the birds and the wildlife, and you no longer enjoy it, you no longer can utilize it for your own selfish human purposes. That's not the point, that's not the message, that's not what we're talking about. Ideally, it's both. Ideally, it's exactly like you see here in some of the other photos. Of it's expanding the uses of the landscape to embrace the wildlife, embrace the birds, and, and give them a space, give them places to exist, to thrive, 
to reproduce and grow and still being able to utilize it in whatever means and whatever uh, you know, modes that, that you have and that you're interested in as well. So uh, we talk about elements of habitat. I'm just going to put these up uh, and uh, that's, that's the, the crux of what we're going to walk through tonight uh, is, is we talk about four key elements of habitat when one is building a nature sanctuary, building a bird sanctuary. We talk about food, water, shelter, and places to raise young, places to reproduce. So four key elements of habitat. And we're going to touch on all four of those tonight um, with a big, big, strong primary emphasis on the food. Um, and then we'll touch on water briefly, and then we'll circle back at the end and, and explain and touch on the other two elements here. So, so what does habitat look like? Okay, so you saw one example. That was habitat, that was a landscape, that was people as well. Um, so, so, you know, we are winter. Um, you know, uh, I, I think you all over in mid-Missouri um, had some snow, uh, perhaps even a couple times. I think you actually got more snow so far this season than we have here in St. Louis. Got a little bit the other day. Um, uh, this was a, a previous winter. Um, but I suggest to you, and it may be obvious to you, that there ain't no habitat here. Um, this, this, is, this, is a, this is an example of a purely, totally human-centered landscape. Uh, this, this ha again, this is winter. Um, you know, this is a different landscape, but also in winter. Uh, this happens to be a public space rather than the private residential space. Um, this particular space is actually pretty okay habitat during the growing season, but there ain't no habitat here during winter. It's all gone. Um, and again, I, I hope you can appreciate that and that makes sense. Um, in dramatic contrast, I think you might look at this and, and say, hmm, yeah, okay, I'm starting to, to get a feel here. Um, there's habitat in this landscape. It's also, again, human, right? We've got the driveway that you can see here uh, in the front corner. You've got a sidewalk here on the left. You've got what would appear to be and is correct. Uh, we do have uh, turf grass. We've got a lawn here in the middle of the front yard, um, but we've got plants. We got stuff. We got things for birds and wildlife within this landscape. Um, happens to be the same landscape. This is just front yard versus backyard. A little bit wilder, a little bit more natural, and yet even though there's more wild and more natural, you still have pathways. You still have lawn space. Right, so this is still a human space as well as the wildlife space. Um, so a couple more examples, uh, and then again we'll start to get in in more detail of how this works and what we look for and what you need to obtain. So shifting to the growing season, right? Shifting out of winter. A couple examples uh, from from spring summer. Um, again, very traditional, um, but you know as you start to get a feel for what we're talking about here, you might readily kind of go, yeah. Yeah, um, that's not a lot. Now, again, there might be some value here. We do have some shrubs up near the house. Might be some value coming out of those. But flat, green, you know, simple monoculture, you know, turfy things. Um, now, I'm not criticizing this. I want to be clear. I'm not criticizing this. Um, if this is what you want, if this is, you know, uh, a value, if you're proud of this, uh, great, fine. I'm just saying there's not a lot of wildlife value here. There's not a lot of bird support. This is not going to be very helpful. If you want to attract birds, you can't do it this way. This is just not going to work out very well. Um, uh, and and uh, so, again, um, uh, like I said, I'm not criticizing that. I'm just saying that that's not going to be the success for the birds. So, so again, a couple more examples. Uh, um, just like that very first photo, this is again a landscape that is a sanctuary, that is birds, that is wildlife. We got lots of plant material here. You know, we get pollinators in the summer, uh, get birds coming in and eating the seeds in the winter. And yet this is clearly a space that is also enjoyed by the humans that live here. You know, we've got the turfy space, we've got lawn furniture, we've got a fire pit, you know, we got people enjoying it. Um, and, and here's another example. Uh, again, uh, different space, but you see the pathways. In this case, the owner wanted to put a small pond in, but you got people walking around, you got people enjoying it, and still plenty of plant material, plenty of good stuff 
for the birds and the other wildlife. Um, so uh, speaking of birds and other wildlife, just a couple examples uh, in some, some cool critters. Um, uh, had the cedar waxwing earlier. This is not as good as a, a good a photo of the cedar waxwing, but now we start to get specific, start to share examples of plants. Um, so this is uh, a, a small uh, flowering uh, tree, uh, a native flowering tree uh, to uh, the, the lower Midwest, to Missouri. This is called downy service berry. It's a very cool flowering tree. You can find it throughout Missouri woodlands in the spring with really neat white early spring flowers. Um, in those flowers, they bloom so early, they get pollinated so early, they turn into fruit sometimes even by May, let alone June. Um, but this plant is already producing edible fruit. Um, and then again, uh, for your birds, uh, like the cedar waxwing, they're going to come in uh, and take advantage of, of that fruit. This is actually uh, the same species of tree. Uh, so this is this is service berry again, is a robin. Uh, this is an American robin taking advantage of that fruit. Um, and this is my first example uh, to share with you some of what I get out of all of this, why I do plant landscaping, why I do gardening for birds and other wildlife. It's to see nature, to see nature in its variety, to see the birds and the other critters in all their different life stages and all the different things that they do in their own lives, because that is just tremendous. It's just, you know, to have nature out your back door, to have nature in your front yard, and not have to traipse to the park, to the wildlife refuge in order to see nature, but to see it happen in your own landscape. And this is a juvenile robin. So that's the example here. This is reproduction. This is life stages, right? This is, this is the juvenile. We know it's a juvenile because of the speckles, because of the spots, the spotted breast. Uh, this bird is relatively recently out of the nest, starting to fend on its own uh, in, in building that adult plumage. Um, uh, speaking of birds, birds that uh, with feeders you might be familiar with. So, so this is a bird, a uh, relatively common bird across the lower Midwest um, that will come to your seed feeders, um, American goldfinch. Uh, and this one's uh, 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 taking uh, sunflower seeds, uh, native sunflower seeds. So you could put out a sunflower seed feeder you could go to the bird store, you could go to, you know, Orschlin, you could go to Farm and Fleet, you could regularly buy your sacks of sunflower seed, or you could just plant native plants um, and feed the goldfinches uh, with the seeds of the flowers. Uh, and this is in our backyard. Uh, this, uh, uh, if the photo doesn't have a name on it, if there's no person attributed to the photo, I took the photo uh, and typically from my own yard. Um, so this is a native sunflower called a cup plant um, that the goldfinch uh, is taking the seeds from. Uh, and I love goldfinches. We're going to talk more about them uh, a little later. Um, uh, speaking of birds in winter and seeds, so here we've got a white-throated sparrow, one of our Canada sparrows, one of the sparrows that come down uh, in the fall uh, and spend the winter with us because um, it's so much nicer here in the middle of winter than it is in Canada, which, you know, typically that, that is true. Um, uh, so they breed in Canada. Uh, they, they do not raise their young here. They go back up north in the spring um, uh, and, and, and they, they breed and raise their young in Canada, but then they come down and hang out here in the winter. Um, this is a white-throated sparrow uh, and it's hanging on New England aster. So a really, really cool and adaptable native perennial flower uh, that is also really good sparrow food in the winter. Uh, I've actually got really poor quality video uh, of the white-throated sparrows uh, eating the seeds uh, from the New England aster. It's not in the presentation because it is pretty poor quality. Um, so, uh, and then again, you know, uh, uh, just more cool photos of uh, our, our birds uh, eating in the landscape. Um, in this case, they're eating insects. Uh, they're eating caterpillars. Uh, we've got chickadees, uh, got a chickadee here on the right side, and then again, the cardinal here on the left uh, eating insects. Um, so uh, native plants, I've made reference to native plants uh, several times already, um, and that's the crux of this entire message today. If, if you got only one thing 
out of the entire talk, my entire time with you, if you took just one thing, uh, it's if you care about birds, you want to attract birds or other wildlife to your landscape, you want to do good for them, it's to plant native plants. Uh, if, if there's nothing else that you get, that's the one most powerful and key through line to this entire discussion is native plants are essential, essential. And I'm going to dive in right now, uh, a little bit of a science lesson, a little bit of ecological uh, terms and things to help you fully appreciate why it has to be native plants in order to do this right. Um, so a oh, couple more quick examples. Um, I, I forget uh, that I had through a few more examples in here. Um, and I do this because even though I said native plants several times, now I'm emphasizing it and saying you have to do native plants to do this right. Well, you might have an impression about native plants. Um, uh, I've met many people uh, over the, the, the last 10 years in particular um, have just sort of a, an unfortunate negative stereotype uh, about native plants. So they're weedy, they're messy, they're aggressive, they're, they're seedy, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it doesn't help that some of our native plants um, uh, actually have the word weed in them. So uh, that's our own fault, right? That's, that's a marketing problem that needs to be addressed and needs to be dealt with. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful will be dealt with. We're going to stop calling milkweed milkweed. Um, uh, this critical essential plant for monarch butterfly reproduction needs, needs to get a PR campaign, right? Um, but seriously, look, I mean, you know, uh, this island bed and then the, uh, nearly all the plants on the left side are all native plants. And this is a really neat and attractive front yard. Uh, these homeowners, uh, they wanted a nice big green lawn space, but they also wanted native plants. They wanted to do their birds and their wildlife right. Um, and so they did an island bed. Uh, native plants do not have to be messy. There's nothing inherently messy about them. Some native plants are more aggressive or more seedy than others. And yet it's all about gardening. I mean, we, we talk about gardening for birds, gardening for wildlife, because it's, it, it's the most critical thing beyond the whole simple tenet of, you know, native plants are required. The very next important principle concept is appreciating and understanding we're gardening with them. So in other words, if, if you want to reinforce the negative stereotype about native plants, then buy a mixed seed packet of natives throw them around your landscape and let them do whatever they want to do. Then you will have the negative stereotype of native plants, but that's not gardening, right? Um, uh, uh, if you garden with them, if you create spaces, you manage spaces, you work with them, uh, you know, you do hardscape, you, you have different elements and features within your landscape, you organize it. Um, if you garden with native plants, you have no reason to fear them. You have no reason to think that they're going to be a problem. Um, here's a small example. Um, this is uh, for anybody that's uh, been to St. Louis, lived here, or visited here much. Um, we have uh, 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 St. Louis City. We have uh, a number of old neighborhoods, uh, uh, tiny little lots, like 3,000 square feet, um, you know, little 30, 40, 50 foot wide lot lots. Um, and this is one of those small St. Louis city lots. And a lot of them have this crazy little, I don't know what probably has to do with uh, uh, just the way the city was developed way back when, 150 years ago. Um, but they've got these steep slopes, these tiny little front yards and these steep slopes. And you see the steps here. And I love this photo for this very reason of this tiny space, challenging space, steep slope, who wants to mow it? And they're like, we're going to go native. Uh, and yet, even though they gave over nearly their entire front yard to native plants, they're still keeping it organized and they've got the, the top here in turf grass. They got patio stones and turf grass and they're managing their landscape. Um, last example, and then I promise we'll get into the science lesson. Um, this is also um, a somewhat small uh, uh, St. Louis city yard. Um, and in this case, they're doing rainscaping. Uh, there's actually embedded on both sides of this front walk, they actually have native plant rainscapes. They have rain gardens uh, on both sides. So they're actually capturing stormwater, temporarily holding it, uh, letting the native plants utilize uh, that, that stormwater. Uh, and, uh, and then it, again, it evaporates, it, it's taken in by the plants, infiltrates in the soil, um, and they have really cool native plants. 
Um, but again, they, they've got hardscape, they've got patio stones, so still gardening with native plants. So why do we need natives? We need natives because all of the songbirds in the lower Midwest um, in fully 90 plus percent, like 96 percent of all land birds across North America eat insects during their life cycle. So just look at the birds here, you know, um, and I'm going to focus on the two on the right, because anybody that does bird feeders, seed feeders, sunflower seed feeders, you know these two. You, you likely know the tufted titmouse on the top and then the cardinals, the male and the female. Um, so bird, birds that routinely, regularly come in year round can come to seed feeders. Well, in fact, they need insects. They require insects during their life cycle. Then here on the left side, we've got a summer tanager uh, and we have a prothonotary warbler and they need insects as well. Um, and all of these songbirds need insects for the protein. Um, just like humans, um, uh, birds are, are very, very analogous when it comes to growth and development. And it, it's just this simple uh, uh, need for protein to build muscle and bone. Um, uh, birds, baby birds cannot develop, they cannot become adult birds if they're on a purely carbohydrate diet. Um, carbohydrates do not allow the building of muscle and bone. They need protein for that. This is an important distinction because your seed feeders are primarily all about carbohydrates. The protein content for seed feeders, even suet, while there's typically more protein in suet than the average seed feeder, there's actually typically a lot of fat in, in suet, but still the protein content in our seeds, in our supplemental seed feeders or suet feeders is not sufficient to build that muscle and bone. Um, so. If you are a songbird, your single best source of protein uh, is insects, uh, is these invertebrates, uh, in, in a, most especially these caterpillars, these butterfly and moth larvae, these young stage of butterfly and moths, soft bodied, you know, uh, slow moving, right? You know, they're not flying away. They're not hard shelled beetles that are really hard to catch you know, really difficult to, to then crunch through and then feed your babies, you know, soft body caterpillars are oh so essential and oh so diverse, right? They're everywhere. You know, there's, there's over 11,000 different species, different varieties of butterfly and moth caterpillars um, across North America. So, so insects, insects are essential for songbirds. Just to reinforce uh, uh, this, this particular fact, this uh, ecological science lesson I'm sharing with you, you know, chickadees, we saw them earlier. Um, uh, in, and here, again, just to reinforce, uh, chickadees are feeding their babies caterpillars. They're feeding insects to their babies, again, that essential protein source. Um, and we had uh, um, a, a group of um, college students. Um, uh, so this is, the study was done a number of years ago. Um, but they observed a nest, um, a chickadee nest, and they, they counted. They, they, I mean, talk about, you know, a, a really boring project, right? You know, but they counted the caterpillars that were brought by the adults to the nest. And, you know, you're talking three to five uh, babies, uh, three to five uh, uh, little um, uh, nestlings, little baby birds, baby chickadees being fed by those adults. But you know, the numbers, you know, six to 9,000 just sounds insane. And yet for anybody that has had the good fortune of observing a songbird nest, a cardinal, you know, chickadee, wrens, you know, a, a backyard bird, I'm not talking about a hawk or an owl, right? Songbirds, right? Stay focused on the small birds, um, the insect eating birds. If you've had the good fortune of seeing uh, one of these nests and you've watched it over a period of time, you likely look at this slide and kind of go, yeah, I never did the math, but I get it. I see the math and it makes perfect sense because you see this dawn to dusk feeding operation, right? Got to feed the babies, got to feed the babies. That's all the adults do. You wonder if they even have time to feed themselves. But that, but that folks is an important connection between those seed feeders and this whole notion of building and gardening for birds, right? This emphasis of the insect protein. Well, look at that chickadee. 
Look at that chickadee. Think about the cardinal coming to their nest and feeding their babies. The cardinal needs to find the insect protein for the babies. And yet you know, if you have seed feeders, that throughout the summer, you see cardinals coming to your seed feeder. Of course you do. Because how easy is it and how helpful is it for that cardinal to come to that seed feeder as an adult, it may have babies on the nest, got to go find insects, feed the babies, feed the babies. And then instead of finding additional insect protein for itself, which would be fine, it would eat it, but it's like, hey, I'll give that to the babies and I'm going to go get a quick hit of the sunflower seed, right? Because I'm an adult, I don't need protein, right? The adults, adult humans, right? We don't need protein injections on a daily basis like the babies do, right? The adult cardinal is not actively growing. So the seed feeder is perfect for the adults. So I'm connecting those two, right? Again, I said, you know, there's nothing wrong with the seed feeders. And in fact, you're still supporting them. It's just, you're not supporting the reproduction if the only thing you have is the seed feeders. So hopefully that all makes sense. So um, I'll put uh, these words up here because we have to connect with plants, right? We have to go from the science lesson of importance of insects to songbirds. Well, how do we get the plants? Well, critical and the essential need for those native plants that I emphasized is because of specialization, because of evolution, because of the way plants and insects have developed over eons. And the simple fact is the lion's share, the overwhelming majority of plants out there um, and the insects that eat them, it's a specialization relationship. And the photo here in the lower right um, is, is no accident. That is a monarch uh, butterfly caterpillar chomping on milkweed. So that is a perfect, very good illustrative example of this thing of specialization. Um, we do not have monarch butterflies without milkweed because monarch butterfly caterpillars can only eat milkweed. So their specialization has evolved to a point where it's just this small array of plants that those caterpillars are able to eat. They cannot digest other plant material. Um, so, so again, you have this throughout the insect kingdom, throughout the critters that eat plants. And again, this makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense when you think about it, because if I'm a plant, right? I cannot defend myself by running away like, you know, a rabbit could from a hawk. You know, I cannot uh, defend myself um, by, you know, concealing myself as maybe a mouse does, right? You know, camouflage, I'm going to hide in the grass, you know? Um, so, so plants are fixed, right? You know, they might have some thorns, they might have some, you know, things, but even the thorns, you know, think about that. You know, I mean, again, a critter munching on the leaves, well, you know, thorns may not be an issue at all either. So these chemical defenses, these chemical compounds within the tissues are the essential way in which plants defend themselves uh, and that drives this specialization. So unfortunately, we filled our landscape for a good 60, 70 years as we've been building out suburbs since post-World War II. We filled our landscape, the landscape uh, industry has provided us a plethora and an array of non-native imported plants. Uh, and those plants uh, operate as statues. Uh, we just do not have insects here that feed on those plants because those plants have evolutionary relationships with insects in their home country. Um, so it's the native plants that we need to reintroduce to our landscapes uh, in order to support those insects that again are critical for the reproduction. So, um, I did not talk to Madeline in advance um, uh, about handouts. So um, unfortunately, uh, I can't tell you exactly how we might make handouts available, but I did uh, remember Madeline say, and we are being recorded. Um, yes, yes, okay. Um, so uh, we do have a recording going, so I guess I don't have to worry about handouts because she's recording this and then they'll post it. Uh, they'll probably post it if they have a YouTube page or they'll post it on their website, but I'm sure she'll let us know at the end exactly where the recording will show up. Um, so now, of course, you also might be taking pictures with your camera uh, of any of these slides. Obviously, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, so this, two slides here, 
this is the reinforce the science lesson. Uh, and then we'll start talking about some more specific plant examples. Um, so this is reinforcing the science lesson. Uh, the numbers you're looking at is how many different species of butterfly and moth caterpillar have been seen feeding on each type of plant. Okay, so again, you know, for the, the songbirds require the insects for the insect protein, the insects require the native plants. And then here you have a slide showing you the dramatic difference between a non-native plant, a typical, traditional, everybody recognizes, understands a boxwood or a hosta or a zinnia, you know, a traditional non-native plant and how few, if any, insects, butterfly, moth, caterpillars can feed on that plant. Um, again, caterpillars. Uh, I understand butterfly adults will come to zinnias, okay? I understand that we're talking about the life stage, right? The reproduction um, and, and those juicy caterpillars that are so, so good insect protein. And then native plants on the left, common examples of native plants, and just huge, huge numbers of insects being supported by those plants. So this is native versus non-native. And then the second slide um, leaves the non-natives behind and just drills into and provides additional examples of native plants separated by herbaceous, right? Your perennial flowers or your grasses uh, versus the woody plants, the shrubs and trees uh, on the left side. And again, you'll recognize many of these, you know, oaks, hickories, of course, maples, um, asters, already mentioned sunflowers as well. Um, so again, we'll, we'll talk some specific examples of these in just a minute. Um, so again, hopefully the science lesson is clear um, because that's, that's sort of it. That is the science for the class today um, because now we're gonna talk all about gardening, gardening practices, some specific plant examples, uh, and hopefully again, resources, right? We'll wrap up with some resources. So this is just a, a really cool photo, stole it from the web, credit to Tom Moxley here. Um, just uh, love to reinforce uh, this, again, this insect thing, this songbird, thing, you know, needing protein, yep, even hummingbirds, right? All of the attention to the sugar water feeders, uh, support the hummingbirds, put out the sugar water feeders. That's fine. Again, you're supporting adult hummingbirds with the sugar water, flower nectar, adult hummingbirds, but that does not help the reproduction. That does not support baby growth, right? If you want baby hummingbirds, you want ruby-throated hummingbirds to live to see another day, you want to encourage the nest in your landscape, um, then you have to have the native plants to provide the insects for the adult hummingbirds to feed their babies insects. Yep, insect protein, gnats, spiders, tiny little caterpillars. Um, and again, those hummingbird sugar water feeders, if you want to keep them out, that's fine. You're, you're going to give, you know, uh, quick octane, uh, you know, fuel hits uh, for the adults while they're going out looking for insects to feed their babies. So as it may be obvious now, um, you know, traditional landscaping here on the left, a couple of examples, boxwoods and Japanese alcova, and then common examples on the right of native plants. Again, we got the milkweed with the monarch, and we got what, um, I've never positively identified this particular photo. I don't know if it's an elm. I'm not sure exactly which, which native tree this is but holes in leaves, holes in leaves are good, right? That shows you that insects are feeding and insects will you know, reinforce the food chain and support the birds and such. So we come back um, to our cedar waxwing. Uh, here's, a, here's a really nice photo, one of the best photos we have, the cedar waxwing in that service berry again. Now, why are we doing this again? Why are we repeating? We're repeating because all the attention to insects that's all about the summer. That's all about the growing season. It's all about the breeding season, right? For our birds, right? Insect protein, feeding babies, reproduction, awesome. Well, the birds don't disappear when the leaves fall off the trees, right? Now, in this case, again, this is summer fruit, but I'm getting at the fact that you wanna support your wildlife, your birds, you wanna support them year round, right? So the insect protein was all about the breeding season. Well, we want to feed the birds and the other wildlife. We want to feed them in the fall and the winter. Well, what do we feed them? We feed them what they would find in the wild. We feed them fruit, plants, native plants that produce fruit. So uh, the service berry we've already talked about. So that was showing it to you again, downy service berry, really cool, small tree. Here's a native shrub, and we've not seen this bird yet. 
So this is a gray catbird, one of my most very favorite of uh, native songbirds, uh, gray catbird. Um, and this happens in our yard, our tiny, our tiny little lot. Um, every fall, um, we get to see gray catbirds migrating south because they stop in our yard to feed on American beautyberry fruit. So this is this, this shrub, this very neat, look at this wonderful lime green, uh, neat foliage, and the fruit has started to mature. Um, still got some fruit, some, some light green fruit hasn't matured yet, but the gray catbird is migrating through and there is fruit here that has matured uh, that the gray catbird is able to eat and fuel on its migration. Um, so, so insects, native plants for insects, native plants for fruit. And here is another slide that again, you might take a picture of or just know that uh, it's in the recording and you can follow up with that or just scribble some notes now. Um, th this is um, a good solid array of readily available uh, and widely adaptable native plants that provide fruit for birds at the various seasons. And you see it's broken up by summer, fall, and winter, right? So these are the seasons where the fruit on that particular plant is typically ripe and available and, and consumed, okay? So um, summer fruit, as you might imagine from the ecology science lesson that we went through, you know, the birds are gonna eat the fruit during the summer um, arguably it's not as essential, summer fruit on native plant is not as essential as the fall and the winter, right? Because again, availability of food in the middle of summer, right? All those insects, all that other stuff. Now, again, that's not to discourage you from planting uh, 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 natives that provide summer fruit. I'm just saying that if you're getting started, if you're prioritizing, if you're looking at different places in your landscape, um, you know, perhaps uh, uh, if you, if you want to start your introduction of native plants that provide fruit, you, you focus and recognize the greater value, the greater um, uh, importance of the fall or winter uh, fruits. And then as you mature the landscape and as you work down the road, um, you know, years in the future, you're like, yeah, let's add some current, let's add some, some, you know, blackberries and things. And oh, by the way, you know, we might like to harvest some of those as well. Um, I'm one of those people. Uh, we planted black raspberries um, uh, in our backyard, um, primarily for wildlife, but we do harvest some. We do take some for snacks uh, when they're ripe and there's a good season for them. So, so um, insects, fruit, uh, and what's next? Well, we come back to where we started. This, folks, these seed feeders we've talked about, various contraptions and the apparatus, right? The the bird feeding industry, you know, I like to say this was not rocket science. You know, this was developed by a very thoughtful entrepreneur who watched the birds in their own space, you know, watched them take, just like that goldfinch we saw earlier, taking the sunflower seeds and they're like, huh, well, there's a lot of people in suburbia across North America. Uh, they don't have the space that I have with these, with these plants. They don't have this, you know, open field. Um, but they'd like to have birds in their backyard. So I bet I could harvest sunflower seeds and I can put them in this tube and then the birds are on this platform and birds would come and eat the sunflower seeds. So in other words, basically we're just sort of recycling. We're going backwards. We're kind of saying, well, you know, again, you can do this and there's nothing wrong with this. Um, but in fact, the native plants is what the birds would do. They would go to the native plants. They would take the seeds from the native plants, right? Goldfinches, here we go again. I told you we were gonna talk about them again. I love goldfinches. Um, there's no name on this slide. So I took this photo from our landscape. Um, so this is Coreopsis. I'm going to highlight several native perennial flowers for you. Actually not individual species. I'm highlighting groups of native perennial flowers. This is Coreopsis. There are several different commercially available uh, Coreopsis species and the and, and the goldfinches don't really care. The goldfinches will eat the seeds of any one of those Coreopsis. Um, uh, this happens to be one called star tick seed, Coreopsis pubescens, um, but lance leaf Coreopsis, there's a tall Coreopsis, there's a, there's a prairie Coreopsis, there's a number of different species. And, and again, sort of check with your resources. We'll talk about that later. 
but build it and they will come. Goldfinches eating seeds of native plants in your landscape, it really is a build it and they will come. Um, and I'll, I'll emphasize that with, again, the next couple of slides. So, um, oh, video, I uh, almost forgot we had a video here. This goldfinch is eating the seeds out of a purple coneflower, Echinacea. So another group of native perennial flowers. Uh, beautiful native perennial flowers when they're in bloom, wonderful pollinator plants. And this goldfinch knows exactly what to do with the seeds uh, on this spent flower. Right next to it, by the way, uh, is a Rudbeckia, um, black-eyed Susan, uh, more commonly known as. So here on the left, this tight little seed head, this is another very reliable finch feeder. I got a small little video, not in this presentation, but I got a small little video right around the holidays this year from goldfinches taking the seeds out of Rudbeckia uh, at our house. Um, so Coreopsis, Echinacea, Rudbeckia, um, and I'll give you two more. Um, this is gray head coneflower. Um, so same common name as the purple coneflower, but it's in the genus Ritibida. Um, you can look that up, you can Google it, um, uh, R-A-T-I-B-I-D-A, -I -I Ritibida, gray head coneflower. Extremely reliable, again, build it and they will come. The goldfinches will pine the seeds of this plant. Um, uh, and I mentioned sunflower. Uh, mentioned sunflowers earlier. There's a number of different native species uh, of sunflower, uh, um, relatively short ones, really big ones, really aggressive ones, more mild ones, but sunflowers, not surprising, are really important, not just finch, but bird feeding plants. Uh, now, uh, I hope it's obvious, but just to reinforce it, this doesn't happen, right? You don't make this happen uh, unless you leave the flowers in the landscape, right? Let the flowers dry up, let the seed heads form, let them ripen, right? Let them dry out and become bird food. Um, now this is gardening practices uh, and you may not be comfortable with leaving those spent flowers everywhere in your landscape. I understand, again, it's gardening, right? We emphasize gardening. So, so uh, you may decide, hey, uh, this is important. We want to feed the birds the seeds in the fall and the winter. So in the backyard, in the side yard, in certain spaces, you allow that, you leave it. But then perhaps other areas, maybe more visible spaces, maybe out by the road, whatever. You're like, yeah, that'll be neat and tidy. We'll clean that up. Or not. Or not. I can tell you in our own landscape here, me and my wife, um, as every year goes by, we get a little bit more naturalized in our front yard. I'm basically, um, without strong intention, it's just kind of happening as, as just things develop. I'm, I'm essentially indoctrinating my neighbors. I'm, getting, I'm helping them get used to the way our landscape looks. Um, I did fully intend, as we started to build out the front yard with native plants, I did fully intend that it would be neat and tidy. Um, it's still landscaped differently than the backyard, um, but my gardening practices are starting to bleed over into the front yard. And, and I'm leaving the plants out there and going, hey, it's important. That video I mentioned that we took right around the holidays was actually taken through one of the bedroom windows into the front yard where we've left the Rudbeckia out here this winter. Um, so, so uh, but, but again, um, you know, it is gardening and you have to make your own decisions uh, and be comfortable with those decisions, but do understand that if every part of your landscape you do fall clean up and you remove all of those seed heads, then you don't have those, those seeds for the birds. So just like the fruit, here is a single slide with a collection of plants, um, broad, adaptable, uh, um, you know, all commercially available, different types of plants, right? Flowers versus shrubs versus grasses. Um, Certainly um, not all of the plants that are out there that would work for this. This is just, again, a good representative sampling of them to get you thinking about this, to get you started, to get you on that path. And then again, here under the flowers, just like I was saying with cone flowers, coreopsis, and so on, you know, the, these, are, these are genuses. These are categories of plants. These are not individual species. There's many. There's six, eight, ten or more different species commercially available native asters, right? So many different ones to choose from. 
short ones, tall ones, blue ones, purple ones, and so on. So again, we need the native plants. Uh, I trust you uh, have accepted the message uh, in the ecology. Talk a little bit about gardening practices um, and then we'll get into the resources uh, and then we'll have time for questions and I'll be roughly true to my promise of having roughly 60 minutes of content. So, so um, here's an example, uh, uh, again, talking about, you know, leaving the seeds out. Look, this is spring now. So this is last year's flowers. That's the, the, the focus of the photo, right? These are last year's flowers. Those are the seeds, what's left of the seeds, um, but it's spring and you have this year's growth coming up. Okay, so, so this is one to say it is gardening and yet nature doesn't need us to garden. So we garden again for our own purposes. We garden for image, we garden for aesthetics, we garden for control, we garden for, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but nature is putting out uh, a zoom in. So this is the same plant, we're just zooming in to, to the bottom and go, you know, it doesn't need it to be cut back. It doesn't need it to be deadheaded. Didn't need it to be cleaned up in the fall or the spring because nobody does this in the wild, right? You know, the plant germinates, the plant puts out new shoots. The old shoots from last year just continue to decay and, and drop off and snap and whatever. And, and the plant doesn't need cleanup. Now that said, uh, within days of taking this photo, we did cut this back. I did come through here and we cut off last year's plant material, made this a neat and organized front bed um, and, and let the new growth come through. But, but again, you know, the plant doesn't require it. We do it for us and, and that's fine. Um, now, here's my other gardening practice or tip. Leave the leaves. If you've been reading about, if you were open to, if you've already been exploring uh, this whole thought process of native landscaping and native plants and gardening for wildlife and such, you may have already been reading about, this is a very, very important and very popular topic that's being talked about a lot just in the last few years. And I'm happy that we're talking about it. I'm happy that I'm talking about it, um, leaving the leaves. So one on the gardening end, and again, on the plant end, plants in the wild, what happened? Does anybody come along and rake out all the leaves in the woodland uh, for all of the, the flowers to germinate in the spring? Of course not, of course not. You know, you go through a Missouri woodland in the spring at a state park, at a natural area, your own backyard if you're fortunate, and you see all of the amazing spring wildflowers pushing up through the leaves. They do not care that there are leaves there. There is no requirement, there's no need to pull the leaves away so that the plants can, can come up. You know, now again, if we have non-native ornamental plants, maybe they need that help, but the natives don't. Uh, this is an example, again, we got leaf litter, it was not cleaned up, it was not removed, and the leaves are pushing up, the plants coming through. Here's another example, different bed, same exact thing. Look, all the leaves, all the leaves from more than one season, you know, in this Culver's root, is pushing up through this. There's New England aster in here pushing through. They don't care. They do not need the leaves removed. The other key point here, and, and another reason why it's so exciting that we're talking about leaving the leaves, is huge majority, um, scientists are telling us it's it, it possibly as much as 80 to 90 percent of those butterfly and moth caterpillars that are so essential for the food web and for the birds also Butterfly and moths are just cool critters, right? They're just amazing critters in their own right. Um, but something like 80 to 90% of them spend some part of their life cycle in the leaf blanket, in that organic layer, that, that, that plant material, that old stuff at the ground layer. 80 to 90% of them require that stuff. Again, if we remove that stuff, if we blow all the leaves out, if we remove all the do the fall cleanup, we take the insect food, we take the, the critters themselves, right? We take all that stuff away. So just like the deadheading though, it's gardening, it's your landscape. I'm not saying stop raking the leaves in the front yard. If you stop like raking the leaves in your front yard, it not just criticism you might get, um, depending upon where you live, uh, it's entirely likely you would kill your lawn. I mean, over time, right, you know, the leaves build up, the leaves build up, 
um, you'd have a little bit of organic, a little bit of mulching going on, but you would literally start to thin out the grass and you would ultimately probably lose your grass. Um, so, so again, this is gardening practices where you can, you know, look at opportunities to do this existing garden beds is the first best place, but you may have little woodlots, little, little open spaces, you know, areas that you can try this. Um, this is one of those invertebrates, one of those crazy cool critters that many of you, many of you may recognize the Luna moth. Um, so again, you know, feeding birds, feeding birds, that's, that's the current, sort of the focus of the talk, but you know, these butterflies and moths are cool critters in their own right. So, all right, we promised multiple elements of habitat, all this attention to food. Uh, we don't want to forget about water. So uh, this is a, a neat little uh, video. Um, I think I can meet this. Yeah, neat little video. Um, this is a pretty significant water feature. Um, and if you're into moving water, uh, this is just to say, hey, uh, if you want to do a moving water feature, we'll do it for wildlife, you know, and you can still enjoy the, the moving water, the sound of the water, um, but having a bubbler, having uh, a pondless feature uh, for birds and other wildlife, but it doesn't need to be fancy. It does not need to be fancy. Um, this is an extremely simple bird bath. Um, got the NPR in the background there. Um, I'm going to play that again. It's such a short video, but so cool. Cedar wax wings uh, happen to be paying attention uh, on the right day. And uh, this is a tiny little snippet of what was at least three dozen cedar wax wings that came in one big flock and they came down in turn and they all got a drink. Um, and the critical importance here is one, the water feature doesn't need to be fancy, but two, in the middle of winter, see again, doesn't need to be fancy, in the middle of winter, it needs to be available. So the emphasis is the portable heater, okay? So you saw an immersible heater here um, in with the cedar wax wings, and then here we have a different style of heater, but still a portable plugged into an extension cord, runs out of the garage, um, and this is uh, ensuring that water is available in the middle of winter uh, for the birds. All right, so um, uh, I promised four elements and because there may be a question about this, I'll go ahead and answer this question in advance. Because if you remember, right, it was food, water, shelter, and places to raise your young. Well, I'm going right in the resources, not because I forgot about shelter and places to raise your young, but because the native plants provide the shelter and places to raise their young, okay? So in other words, it's not a separate thought process. It's if you provide the food, if you follow the thoughts, if you get into the resources and you know, start exploring this uh, and use the other references that we're gonna talk about and you start putting native plants in your landscape for food, you're also, especially with the woody plants, the shrubs and the trees in particular, uh, you're providing nesting opportunities, you know, tiny little branch structures, um, uh, you know, uh, places to shelter uh, in the winter. Um, so again, it's not separate, but we covered it. You just didn't realize it. Um, so, so resources, uh, wrap up with resources here. Uh, and then uh, again, we'll have some time for, for questions. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm a book person. Um, um, uh, don't know if you can see the gray hair. Um, but I'm just old enough um, that uh, um, I, I have embraced technology. I have a smartphone. Um, I do have a few apps on the phone, um, but I'm, I'm a book person. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a text, I'm a physical book person. Um, and so this means a lot to me. Uh, and and uh, I've met a lot of folks uh, that, that are doing habitat gardening, bird gardening, and they really like their books. Um, so, so this is a good assortment um, of uh, really powerful tools for this thought process. Um, uh, there's plenty more out there. Um, I'm going to highlight one very specific uh, um, book, uh, two books, sorry, um, Native Landscaping for Wildlife and People here on the lower right. Um, uh, I, I don't know, I did not look this up before uh, we started the class, uh, the, the, the presentation, um, but it's possible uh, the, the library, the Missouri Library um, uh, has this in their inventory. Um, uh, it's been around for, for a good number of years. It's published by the Conservation Department, um, but so you might be able to borrow it from the library. Um, 
Uh, if not, um, you can certainly find them online. Emphasis is used copies. Uh, the book is out of print. So if you look for a new copy, you're gonna be getting some pretty stiff prices. Um, and then I will simply note um, uh, here, upper right, nature's best hope, Doug Tallamy. Uh, we've gotten to know Doug pretty well. He's come to Missouri a lot over the last um, uh, eight to 10 years. We had him here in St. Louis this past March, just before uh, COVID. Um, but uh, Nature's Best Hope was his book uh, published in 2020. Um, and it's an insanely cool book. And it's especially helpful for anybody that you want to inspire down this same path. Right. So if you know people, if you've drinking the Kool-Aid, you like what you hear, you're going to, you know, charge down into native plant landscaping. Um, you may not need the book, although the book is still really interesting. But especially if you know people uh, that you'd like to help inspire on this path, it's a it's a good read. It's written for average landowners. Um, uh, it's it's not uh, it's very very easy to read. Uh, very helpful. Very insightful. Uh, and a very very cool. Very good book. All right. Other resources, um, uh, do-it-yourselfers. Um, if you like technology, you like the idea of using the web uh, and, and getting uh, specific uh, uh, plant advice uh, off the web, uh, National Audubon through the Plants for Birds program. Uh, there's the web address for it, or you could Google Plants for Birds. Um, National Audubon created an interactive, uh, wonderful plant database that is zip code oriented. So you put in your zip code and it gives you plant recommendations uh, for your specific zip code based on the other switches that you click in the search tool, right? So if you want woody plants, if you want big plants, if you want perennial flowers, uh, you know, if you need moist plants or, or full sun plants, you click the different buttons uh, in the advanced search for your zip code and it'll give you a menu of plants. So very cool. The Missouri Botanical Garden, uh, their plant finder, is also a very robust search tool. Um, uh, it, of course, uh, um, uh, is not only native plants, the, the, the plant finder through the garden, uh, which is fine, because uh, again, it doesn't have to be either or. Uh, you can have native and non-native. I, I have non-native plants at our house here. Um, uh, the Botanical Gardens plant finder, it doesn't have the zip code function. Um, so, but it, it does have a, a switch where you can click Missouri native. Um, so, so you can do that. Um, additional resources um, uh, and partners. Uh, I mentioned the conservation department earlier. I do encourage you to, to peruse their website. Um, uh, lots of good, they have an online um, field guide uh, about plants. They have lots of resor resources you can order. You can get print copies mailed to you um, for free. Uh, all sorts of cool stuff online through MDC. Grow Native, uh, grownative.org. Uh, they have a plant database on their website as well. I was looking at it earlier today. Um, uh, I don't, as you might imagine, uh, you know, if you do this for a while, I don't use the, the databases as, as much as, as others might. Um, but Grow Native recently, uh, last year, they upgraded their website and their search function is also very robust. Uh, it doesn't do the zip code thing, but it does have lots of cool different switches and you can get very specific on the plants you're looking for. Um, uh, Grow Native uh, through the Prairie Foundation also has a, a, a really nice array of online webinars. Um, uh, again, you want to learn more, you want to do more in, uh, insightful programs like this. Now that I'm, I'm get, whetting your appetite. Uh, Shaw Nature Reserve um, also, uh, they put their plant school online uh, because of COVID. So they have a native plant school, um, which is a really cool thing to investigate. They also um, have Shaw Nature they have a native landscaping manual. Um, they have a four chapter series on their website, a native landscaping manual. And the coolest thing about it is if you want your own physical copy, again, if you're like me, you can order one for $5, each chapter is $5, um, or you can download for free the PDF um, of, of each one of the chapters. So you can just look at it online. Uh, my last one here um, is uh, Wild Ones. Um, we uh, work a lot here in St. Louis uh, with uh, uh, the local chapter of Wild Ones, the St. Louis Wild Ones. But you have a mid-Missouri chapter. Uh, they're, they're based out of Columbia. Um, uh, I don't know the folks out there personally, but um, uh, my understanding is uh, that they, 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 as it says, mid-Missouri, they support the region. 
So, so they may be based in Columbia, but I'm pretty sure that so supporting you uh, uh, in, in the Jeff City area as well. Um, but um, really cool folks. Um, they do garden tours. Uh, um, uh, they share plants, um, you know, just uh, native plant uh, crazy folks uh, through Wild Ones. Um, let me take a drink here. I promise it's just water. Um, but uh, this, I left this in um, for a couple of reasons. Um, this is actually uh, our Bring Conservation Home program in action. So uh, I understand uh, I did uh, uh, mention, and I do want to reinforce that our Bring Conservation Home program is a St. Louis regional program. But uh, should you happen to live in or near the Columbia area, Columbia has a program called Como Wild Yards. Um, it is identical to our Bring Conservation Home program, and, and both programs are our habitat house calls. Uh, we actually come out to the landscape and, and we spend a couple hours and consult with you. Um, now, again, this was pre-COVID, so, so we don't do this right now, uh, at least not that way. Um, but um, the net result for the small fee that you pay, both either in Columbia or here in St. Louis, um, is detailed written recommendations on how to improve your landscape um, for wildlife with native plants. So um, that um, is my story. Um, and I, I'll close here um, with a summary slide, but first just some, some happy folks um, that have utilized our Brain Conservation Home Program. Uh, but I left them in, uh, one, because it's always cool to um, uh, emphasize people, right, as I did at the start. Again, uh, we're the ones that do the work, you know, uh, we're doing it for the critters, for the wildlife. We're still enjoying the landscape, um, but we're doing the work. Uh, so recognize these folks, um, uh, but also because um, those signs that they're holding, those happen to be Bring Conservation Home certification signs, but there's lots of yard signs out there uh, that you can buy. You can just go online. The Prairie Foundation sells yard signs, Grow Native. Um, you can buy them through other sources. You can get yard signs uh, through uh, Xerces Society. Um, and, and you see it here on, on my list of, of, of things you could do. Um, you know, should you get started? Should you, should you go down this path? Um, you know, please talk to your friends, neighbors, and relatives, right? Share the message, share the word. Um, you know, look for ways to put those plants front and center and let people ask about them and talk about them. Yard signs are really important. They're a really important way to share that message, to, to share what people are looking at and help them understand what you're doing. And again, it is gardening. Uh, that is what this is all about. Um, uh, it is gardening and it is gardening practices and, and we're still using the landscape. So um, I'm going to stop share. Um, a little bit more than 60 minutes, um, but uh, still got some folks on and uh, I'm thinking we got some questions. So um, I'll stop share. I'm gonna pull up chat, um, uh, but rather than me read it, I'm going to trust um, that Madeline is on line uh, and hopefully she has gone through uh, and maybe she's read some of these questions. Madeline, are you there? Yes, yes I am. Um, and I did want to say that I copied down the titles of the books that you mentioned. We have some of them, and I will certainly look into buying more of them. So, awesome. awesome. Yeah. And we will be recording this, uh, or we have recorded this, and it will probably be posted on our YouTube channel sometime maybe mid next week, is my guess. Excellent. Excellent. And, and yeah, I'm looking at the questions here. Um, it looks like the the, the, the first series of questions was, was the audio issues we had uh, when you were doing introduction, but we resolved mm -hmm. that. Um, Missouri Wildflowers Nursery, yes, uh, thank you for that. I'd actually um, even, um, well, let's see, I don't, uh, well, uh, you can see my video. I don't, I'm not screen sharing anymore, but um, if, you're, if, you're seeing, if you're looking at my video, I actually had, I pulled the Missouri Wildflowers Nursery catalog out because I did want to uh, give a plug to them. Um, uh, uh, for anybody in the lower Midwest, but especially for, for those of you in, in mid-Missouri, um, uh, it's an amazing local resource for you. Uh, there in Brazito, just south of Jeff City on 54. Um, uh, great place to visit, um, but a wonderful online resource, a great catalog. They'll mail you the catalog um, if you just uh, send them an email. Um, and um, uh, 
uh, yeah, I, I can't I can't say enough good things about the Missouri Wildflowers University. That they're probably uh, not probably they are one of the probably top two or three entities in our part of the world that gets credit uh, for really really pushing native plant landscaping over the last uh, you know ten to twenty years. They've been around a long time. Um, but their presence, their diversity of plants, uh, their inventory, their catalog, their knowledge with their staff, uh, they, they've just really, really done a tremendous job in helping uh, spread the word uh, and, and, and again, the availability of plant material. Um, so, so yes, very, very good resource. Um, Kansas City. Um, so uh, first of all, um, you know, the books, of course, obviously apply, you know, uh, uh, Grow Native, you know, write the online references, you know, the conservation department, all of that, of course, is available for the folks over in Kansas City as well. Uh, the Wildflowers Nursery, uh, it is worth pointing out um, that one of the cool things that while they're based and they grow their plants in Brazito, um, what Wildflowers Nursery has been doing for years is they have plant sales that they support across the entire lower Midwest. So if you go to their website at any given time of the year, you can see their calendar of events. Uh, and Kansas City is uh, uh, almost as popular with their events as the St. Louis region has been. So, so that's a really good resource where you don't have to go to Jeff City, you don't um, have to uh, mail order. Uh, you can just look at the event calendar uh, and wait for them to come and, and, uh, and you can order, you can order your plants in advance of those events um, and, uh, and they'll bring them uh, uh, to that event uh, in your region. Um, let's see, what else? Um, oh, uh, and, um, oh shoot, um, Deep Roots, Deep Roots, uh, Kansas City, uh, look up Deep Roots. Um, I can't say any more about it. Um, uh, I lived in Kansas City for two years, but that was before I really got into native plants. But look up Deep Roots uh, because I think they're, they're, uh, there's another umbrella organization that escapes me right now. But, but you do have some really cool local resources in Kansas City. Um, uh, and, and you've also got an Audubon Society over there called Burroughs Audubon, um, uh, which is also doing some really good things in this area. So uh, let's see, uh, uh, Coralberry. Um, uh, uh, specific question about Coralberry. Um, a very cool native plant, um, a small woodland shrub. So uh, beautyberry, we had that photo with the gray catbird uh, and the beautyberry fruit. Coralberry is, is kind of like the, uh, the, the poor little stepchild of beautyberry, um, which is not fair to coralberry because coralberry is actually a, a, a more prolific plant. Um, uh, it, it's, um, it, it, uh, um, but it's just smaller, uh, physically smaller in stature. The, the fruit is, is smaller. Uh, it's not as dramatic. It's not as, quote, pretty, uh, human pretty. Um, but uh, especially if you have a woodland, uh, if you have a woodland, um, coral berry uh, is a very cool plant to introduce into your woodland um, if it's not already present. Um, uh, for small suburban landscapes, we don't typically recommend coral berry just because it, it, uh, as small as it is, it can be aggressive. Uh, it's a woody plant that spreads by overground runners. Um, that's a little bit unusual, but that makes it uh, quite aggressive. Uh, but, but it's a very cool plant, uh, it's a very good wildlife plant. Um, uh, yes, uh, uh, I mentioned Como Wild Yards for those in Columbia, Missouri. Um, and uh, if you Google Como Wild Yards, you'll find it very easily, but it's actually managed through the city of Columbia. Uh, the city of Columbia has a... Uh, a conservation, um, uh, 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 conservation um, uh, staff person does conservation things throughout the city, uh, and they manage the Como Wild Yards program um, uh, through that. Um, let's see um, the video. So, uh, Madeline, I, I think you um, mentioned. Yes. Yeah. Our YouTube Wall channel. Street. Yeah, it's just Missouri River Regional Library. Full name. Okay, and that and that's a YouTube channel. Yes. Awesome. Great. Wonderful. Um, let's see. Robbins. Let's see. Uh, Powell Gardens. I, excellent. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, uh, again, mentioned I, I was in Kansas City for a couple of years, but uh, nose of the grindstone working 
uh, work in convenience retail and, and wasn't into landscaping. But yeah, I, I ever since, ever since I got to St. Louis and, and we, we've got the Brink Conservation Home Program, uh, you know, I, I constantly hear about Powell Gardens and thank you for the pointer. That is a very good uh, uh, suggestion for anybody either in Kansas City or passing through Kansas City. Um, uh, lots of good stuff there. Um, River Oats. So yeah, on one of the slides, it was the seed slide, right? It was the slide that listed, uh, you know, dozen, 15 different plants that are good, reliable seed sources. So um, yeah, River Oats uh, is a, um, a shade tolerant woodland native grass. Um, so, so it's a quality native plant. Um, it, it can be aggressive. Um, it can be prolific. It can fill in landscapes. Um, emphasis on can. Um, so it just, it's one of those plants uh, where it just depends on the exact site conditions and whether it finds a place, it finds purchase, if you will. Um, because I've talked to plenty of people uh, and I was one of them actually. I put river oats in our front yard when we had shade, when we had two large mature shade trees in the front yard. I had a tiny little woodland garden, a uh, little shade garden and I put river oats in there and it never went beyond the original planting. Um, and and I, I, I don't know, uh, honestly, if it was just, you know, I was mowing grass, I, you know, I, I, I never, you know, really figured out exactly why it didn't spread. Um, but I've, I've talked to plenty of other folks that have had similar experiences of, you know, uh, river oats gets this rap of it's aggressive. Well, clearly not always, not everywhere. Um, so, so it, it's just be aware of it. Yes, good caution, um, uh, but uh, uh, definitely something to consider in certain places. Um, uh, very good. Uh, I, I don't see any more questions right now. I certainly don't want to keep people um, uh, uh, if, we're, if we're basically done. Um, but uh, I had a great time. I, I hope you learned uh, some things. Uh, I hope I was helpful, um, uh, you know, inspired you if you weren't already inspired or gave you tools if you were already getting going with this. Um, and uh, Madeline, any closing words? Oh, just thank you so much. This is a wonderful program, Mitch. Really appreciate it. Uh, I didn't say at the beginning uh, that you've been gardening with native plants for 15 years, and uh, you have you, you're supporting uh, a current inventory of 80 species of native native plants. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah, and and uh, um, you know that's that's an interesting uh, comment because um, uh, uh, it it I can wrap that back into uh, you know one of the themes I, I was talking about uh, here at different points in time, um, and including on the closing slide of starting small, you know, be patient. Um, uh, you don't need a large space. You don't need uh, to give over your entire landscape. Um, I mentioned like, you know, St. Louis city lots with 3000 square feet. Well, ours isn't that small, but we are an older neighborhood uh, in suburban St. Louis County. And our, we have less than a quarter acre. I think the lot is, I'm supposed to remember this, but I think it's like a, like a 10,000 square foot lot. It's something like that. This, this is a small lot. And in that space over 15 odd years of gardening, um, you know, and, and we, we, we're not competitive. We're not like trying to add more plants all the time. It's just we've accumulated in all the different little nooks and crannies and garden beds and spaces. We're, we're you know, we're pushing up toward 80, 90 different species. Um, and that's kind of important because diversity is really, really critical, right? That's one of the ways that we get these critters, these birds, these interactions is the diversity of life, the diversity of the plants. So. So yeah, thanks for for uh, for that point, Madeline. So I had a great time. Uh, it's my pleasure to do this. So again, uh, thank you, thank you again for the invite um, and the opportunity. Okay, thank you again. Good evening. <laughs> right. Good night. Good night.